Well, good evening. We got a little ring in here. We're um, starting up again tonight, and so in the coming weeks and months, we're going to be putting this together. We're going to be recording this so that we can put it online. We have most of, uh, or a good chunk of our members who are either away or at home. Some of them are um, not able to be out right now because of health things, but thank you for being here. And as we build and as we get together in the coming weeks and months, we pray that we can be a blessing to you. These are interesting times, amen? Yeah. And so, uh, you know what's great is that, well, times can be challenging and overwhelming. God always is bigger than our problems. And so we're going to demonstrate the coming weeks and months a little bit by looking at the life of a young man named Joseph. And so we're going to start that in a little bit. Now, the, I have expressly asked all kinds of health professionals and the ministry of health and everything like that. And I'm getting mixed messages. And so here's what I would like us to do is we're going to have the worship team. They're going to lead in some worship. Um, we ask early on that you do not sing or sing to yourself, but we will invite you to stand. Now, the great thing about worship is you don't just have to sing or you don't have to sing to worship. You can put your hands up. You can close your eyes. Someone even suggested humming. Okay. And we're going to try that for a little bit and we will we'll, uh, hopefully in the weeks and months to come give you an opportunity to just bellow it out. Okay. So we'll get you to stand. We'll invite the worship team and I'll open in prayer. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for bringing us together. And Lord, as we are here gathered in your name, I pray you would be here in our midst, that you would strengthen and encourage us. Father, there's a lot of afraid people, a lot of people full of fear right now. And it is our prayer, Father, that you would fill us with courage and faith. And at this time, we could be a light and a beacon to our world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hello. So hey. exciting to see everyone again. It's much better being here than on my couch by myself trying to record some music, I'm not going to lie. We went over this earlier about how many takes a lot of those took. They weren't just first takes, let's be honest. So I'm really excited that I get to be back with my team and you. So let's worship together. I knew 
All my fears and doubts, they can all come to because they can't stay alone when I'm here with you. And it's a new horizon, and I'm set on you. And you meet me here today, mercy's at a new. All my fears and doubts, they can all come to because they can't stay alone when I believe you are the way, the truth, the light. I believe you are the way, the truth, the light. fears and doubts, but they can all come to, because they can't stay alone, when I'm here with you, and it's a new horizon, and I'm set on you, and you meet me here today, with mercies that are new, all my fears and doubts, but they can all come to, because they can't stay alone when I believe you are the way, the truth, the light. I believe you are the way, the truth, the light. I believe.
One of the uh, interesting things about trying to examine our times is, is what we compare it to. And so we take what we're going through right now as a society, what we call a pandemic, and we try to look back. And we look back at times in history that this kind of thing has happened. Pandemics are, are not new. In fact, they've been uh, with the world as long as people have been around. Um, we have really, as a generation, grown up um, free of them until now. There have been scares. A lot of you can remember SARS. Um, some of you have been around long enough to remember the polio um, sickness that used to ravish people and, and, uh, and the time a cure was found for that. It, it really has only been about 100 years that we've had penicillin for combating things and, and, and that millions and millions of people have been saved by that. But for us this is new. We live in a world where we're, we're asked to stand apart and we're social beings. We are used to touching and connecting and sharing and interacting. It was really funny because a lot of people would look at today and they would say, um, we're so disjointed because of social media. But to be honest with you, I think we were a lot more jointed than we thought we were because now that this has driven us apart, we just realize how much we miss other people. Whether you're an introvert or an extrovert. I know I've got a couple introvert friends who have said this has been the time of their lives. <laughs> you know, hold up in their bedrooms, uh, you know, on, on their computers or, you know, just staying apart from people and stuff like that. For, but for most of us, even the hardcore introverts, we miss each other. And so we look back to look forward. And so I'm going to, over the next few weeks, take us way back into history. Um, to talk about the life of an individual who lived about 3,500 years ago. We know this is actually a historical figure because we have verifying reports from the records of the Egyptians and the Hebrews and, and, and many since then um, that verify the life of this individual. But we're going to be talking about a young man who starts out a little bumpy and who starts out um, in circumstances where we would tend to look at him and not picture him as a hero. In fact, at, at first this individual is anything but a hero. He's, uh, he's got many brothers. His father, who was kind of an interesting character himself, um, had two wives. He didn't ask to have two wives. He was kind of tricked into having two wives. He thought he was marrying one and ended up marrying another and then had to wait a little longer and marry the other. Um, and then these two wives, being very competitive, um, wanted to have him to have children because in that kind of society, whoever had the most children was kind of more prominent. This is how families worked in those days. And so they started a competition to have children, and, and they brought their, they, this was actually used in those days, they, they brought a couple of their servant girls into this process, and before you know it, Jacob was fathering children through four different women, and, and naturally, as you can imagine, he had a whole boatload of them, particularly a lot of sons. And these sons, these individuals who are introduced at this point, were going to be the um, fathers of what we call the 12 tribes of Israel. These individuals, their names, if you ask most Jewish people, they can trace their names right back to these individuals and can say, I'm from the tribe of Benjamin, or I'm the tribe of Reuben, or I'm the tribe of Manasseh. You can trace that right back to 3,500 years ago to these individuals. And they start in a family that is very dysfunctional. Jacob, the interesting character, favors one of the children. He was a child that was born to Jacob when he was older by his favorite wife, Rachel. And so Jacob will focus in on this one young man, and this is going to cause all kinds of problems for him. But as we, we first see this, this character in, in action, we see this young man the first thing we hear about him is he's coming to give his father a bad report about his brothers. 
How do we sum that up? He was tattletaling on them. And that would have not gone over well if his father had had any um, integrity himself to not allow one brother to tattletale on the others. I'm a little brother. I have three older sisters. And I know as a younger sibling, the dynamics of family are very different if you're a baby of a family versus a firstborn. A number of years ago, I was doing weddings, and I, I think I've done 75 or 80 weddings by now, but I noticed a trend, is that a majority of the weddings, and most, most people in Western society will have two children. Some people have more. Um, some people do see it as competition. They have seven or eight, but most, most North American people have two children. And I noticed that a lot of firstborns were marrying secondborns, and not very often did I see two firstborns get together or two secondborns. In fact, one of the two couples that I did their weddings for who were secondborns are actually sitting in this room right now. But a majority of them, you would find a firstborn and a secondborn. And I learned those dynamics is that firstborns are often attracted to secondborns because secondborns help them loosen up. They're fun. And secondborns are actually attracted to firstborns because firstborns do things that secondborns need someone to do, like pay the bills, make sure there's gas in the tank, and provide a little leadership and order. And so this is a dynamic I've seen over and over and over again. Well, in this family, the secondborn is actually given more power than the firstborn and in some ways more responsibility. And you say, how do they do that? Well, his father made Joseph a special coat of different colors. In that society, we quite literally be giving him this special coat to say, this is my favorite son. In those days, if most people wore brown or sandy brown, okay, from the carcasses of animals, they painted their clothes and the wool and everything like that, and you live in a, an arid climate, everything turned brown, okay? For a young man to be wearing this beautiful multicolored thing, first of all, would have been extremely expensive to make, and it would make him stand out from everyone. And so people would look at Joseph and they would say, this guy must be special. But he shouldn't have been special. He was like number 13 or 14 in a family of older brothers. And his brothers hated him, but Joseph actually uses this favor against his brothers. He becomes a spy on them. And so what he does is when his brothers do something he doesn't like or that their father might not like, he goes to daddy and tells them and his daddy gives them in trouble. And then we find ourselves in this story, this young man Joseph starts having dreams. He has two dreams in particular. Both the dreams, to sum up a little bit about what they are, they represent himself standing upright and everyone else bowing down before him. And he lists a number of units bowing down before him, whether it's stars or sheaves of grain or whatever, and it's the same number of brothers he had. Now, I might want to sit, to sit on that dream, but Joseph doesn't. He can't wait to tell his brothers about this dream. So you imagine telling someone, say, hey, I had a dream, and I was elevated and you were bowing down to me. Now you imagine just telling anybody that, are you going to expect a positive reaction to that dream? Probably not. Yet he shares this dream, and, and the gasps and anger and animosity pointed towards him did not deter him from actually repeating it again when he had a second dream. Joseph is an incredibly tone-deaf individual. So picture this, this conniving, underhanded individual. There's three, three kind of dysfunctions that stand out in this family, and they're not just Joseph. The first one are what we call triangles. Relational triangles, and, and you're, going to, you're going to identify these very quickly. You may have triangles in your family or your work situation. Triangles are where individuals try to control other people by controlling a person that's connected to them. Okay, so if I got a problem with Bob, I don't go to Bob to try to influence him. 
when I find somebody who's connected to Bob or who's in authority over Bob or is married to Bob or is in a family or friendship to Bob and I rat Bob out and I tell them negative things about Bob in order to get that person to influence Bob to do what I want him to do. This family has all kinds of triangles. It has Joseph as a triangle with his father against his brothers. He has his brothers divided among themselves when they throw Jacob, or Joseph into this well and then they end up slaving, selling him into slavery. The eldest brother Reuben, the firstborn, recognizes that killing the brothers probably not a good idea. And so he conspires to get his brothers just to throw him in this well, this dry well, hoping to come back later and take him back to his dad. So here's Reuben triangling around his brothers. And we have Jacob who's strangling around his sons. And you have this highly dysfunctional family. Triangles have been part of that family for a couple of generations. In fact, Jacob's wives and his parents and his uncle triangled around him all the time. And you may have triangles in your world. In fact, you probably do. You have someone maybe you work with, and they'll never tell you to your face something they want you to do, but they'll go to the boss and try to influence you through the boss. They, uh, you may have someone in your family, you know, the one that works the phones, or the ones on social media. People can be incredibly manipulative, and if you've had, ever had children, <laughs> they start this at about one and a half. Children are very socially active. And they will triangle around you. Why do people triangle? Well, the real reason they triangle is because it's very uncomfortable going to an individual and saying, I don't like this about you, or I want you to change this. You know, if we lived in a world where we insisted that the only way to resolve conflict is actually with the person you're having conflict with, about 99% of the conflict in our society would go away. Do you know that? For a couple of reasons. One is if I'm mad at you, and I come to you and say it, I've got to ask this question first. Is it worth it to go to them and risk alienating or causing wrath or, or going through the rigmarole of convincing them of their wronghood? Is this really a big enough deal that I need to do this? The other reason is, too, is when I hear that someone's unhappy with me, but they've sent someone else to do it, you know how that makes me feel? It makes me feel betrayed. It makes me feel angry. It doesn't resolve the conflict. It just creates anger towards the individual who was too chicken to come to me and to say, this is a problem I have with you. Triangles are all through our society. Uh, a female uh, sociologist called Randy Gunther wrote numerous books on triangles. She actually talked about it. And she writes, established family members can exert significant influence over their members, even well after they've created new families on their own. In moments of conspiracy, they can sometimes make or break these newer relationships by consistent undermining of one or the other or the other's partner's value, or even by intentional sabotage. Sometimes these sabotaging family members do not even attempt to hide their dislike of the partner they would like to disappear. If the person in the middle is in a loyal conflict between two participants, he or she may allow that family member to continue berating the other partner or risk deflating that person. Whichever the decision is, it will send a clear message of who is the most important. Triangles divide people, they separate them, they set us in hierarchies over each other, and this family will have a lot of triangles. The second is the aspect of deceit. It was a deceitful family. Now, again, they came by it honestly. Jacob's name actually meant the deceiver. You see, when he was born, he was a twin. And when he was born, his brother Esau was born first, making him the firstborn. But Jacob was born holding on to his ankle. Now, in those, that society, to fight by grabbing an ankle was to cheat. It was to be considered deceit, so they actually named him Deceiver. See, in those days, the firstborn was really important. Everybody else was kind of just extra kids to help around the farm. And so they gave him a rotten name. Well, the thing is, Jacob grew up to really live up to this name. He was an incredibly deceitful individual. 
and his deceit in undermining his brothers and, and to tell tales about them or to tell them about these dreams, first of all, you've got to ask the question, did he really have the dreams? Yeah, we know he had the dreams because later we're going to find out they come true. Does the stuff he was telling his brothers, you know, uh, his father about his brothers, was it true? Well, he might have rubbed a bit of mustard on it, but it probably was true. But you know what? Sometimes there's more important things in life than being right. Rabbi Zacharias, who's passed away recently, great to the great to the loss of the great loss to the church, an incredible spiritual giant, wrote that truth that is not undergirded by love makes the truth obnoxious and the possessor of it repulsive. Joseph's truth was going to make him a stench in the nostrils of his brothers, so much so that they wanted to kill their brother. And then the third thing is he was born to an indulgent father. Uh, a man named uh, Dwayne Burmeester has done extensive studies on the dynamics of family and how families develop and how people develop healthy relationships through family. And he talks a lot about the, the, how the younger siblings in a family mature in their teen years by developing relationships with peers and then come back to their family and are able to work more as equals so that when all the family members get to a certain age, they all interact with as adults. Joseph's 17 years old when this happens, and he has not matured in this. Burmeister writes, cross-sectional work suggests that in adolescence, sibling relationships become more equal in the balance of power as firstborns begin to relinquish some of their control and secondborns acquire more equal status. There are five domains that the, this writer talks about that are part of healthy adult development. Initiating relationships, self-disclosure, asserting displeasure with others' actions, providing emotional support, and managing interpersonal conflicts. Because Joseph is born to this indulgent father who favors him, he fails on all five. So at 17 years old, he has no friends. He's just him and daddy against everybody else. And he hasn't learned how to work with his brothers and negotiate with them and talk with them and to be able to share his heart or be able to resolve conflict with them. And it creates this horrific scene. This young man who is anything but desirable. Now, do you really hate him now? You know what? We're going to talk about him about five, six more weeks. Why? Why does God use this guy to talk to us? A couple of reasons. And this is week one. And in week one, God isn't mentioned much. All we get is this nuts family. This highly dysfunctional family. This family full of deceivers, murderers, people that are willing to sell their brother into slavery, and to the Ishmaelites. You know, in those days, that would have been a huge slap in the face. You see, Jacob's father was Isaac. Isaac had a, a brother who was expelled from the family named Ishmael. Ishmael had lots of children and became the father of many nations, most of them in the Middle East today. And to sell the son or the grandson of Isaac to the Ishmaelites from the outcast family would have been a double blow to Joseph. These were the people you didn't want to give your children over to because there was hatred and animosity that has lasted in the Middle East to this day. Why does God give us this guy? Why does he start with a young man that is anything but heroic like Joseph? Well, for a couple of reasons. One is this. Is we are utterly dependent in understanding that there is a good and powerful God. You see, if I start addressing the pain and torment and fear of this world, the things that we face, just based on me, I'm a broken model. And you are too. We need something. We need a power source. We need a personality. We need a giver of good. We need a, 
a, a, a source. You know, it's really interesting because this little sociological scientific experiment that's going on in our society has revealed a lot of things about us sociologically. And one is, is how badly we need each other and, and how we miss each other. But there is a greater dependence that has also been rising to the surface in our world, and that is, is that we need God. Why do we need God? Well, because without this powerful, gracious, involved God, we do not have it within ourselves to answer the questions of life. You may say, oh, you know, science has addressed so many things, and it has. I mean, I love science. I, 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 I've learned so much. You know, I love to study. I love to read it. But there are questions of issues around forgiveness, questions of maintaining long-term relationships to fallen and broken people, of family, of death, of grief, that can only be answered by the hand and expression of a suffering Savior and a powerful good God. And so as we look at Joseph, it's like God's starting this story and he's saying, okay, we got this deceitful guy named Jacob. He has a bunch of rotten kids. We have the youngest one. He's the most rotten of them all. And, you know, we're going to sell him into slavery. <coughs> Excuse me. It's coughing. That's not very good right now. Um, and, and this is going to be the individual we're starting with? Talk about two strikes down in the bottom of the ninth. There better be a good, powerful God who's going to come and be a part of this. The second thing is it demonstrates our brokenness. Because, I'm going to be honest with you, I see a little myself in Joseph. Not just because I was a younger brother. I, was a, I, I still am a rotten brother. My poor sister's. I mean, I torment them. I'm in my 50s. And I still torment my sisters. I just can't help myself. You see, I've watched my sisters, and you know, watch them get married and have kids and grandkids and all that, and I've learned something about them. As their younger brother, I'm the only individual who can tell them the perfect, plain truth. Their husbands sure aren't going to say it. And so my poor sisters, you know, they'll do something or say something, and if there's anybody in the room that can say, well, that's just this, it'll be the rotten little brother, right? But it's okay, because they give as good as they get. But there's, I see something else in Joseph. I see this little individual who's in this fam, dysfunctional family, and that's his whole world. He's 17 years old, and he hasn't grown up. And I go... What little bubble do I have around me right now that I think is the whole universe? I, my wife and I, sometimes we get a little saying, you know, we find an individual who's completely narcissistic, we'll say, this is me, this is the world rotating around me. <laughs> but we're all like that, aren't we, sometimes? We have an incredible ability to see the world through our own light. You know, you encounter a crazy driver, and uh, if they're going too fast, they're a maniac. If they're going too slow, they're a doofus, right? But maybe we're the fast one to someone else. Maybe we're the slow one to something else, somebody else, right? We need the Josephs of our world, because here's the thing. If Joseph was a perfect individual, we're not going to read much about him. Because nobody's perfect, right? We're all fallen. Somebody once said, you know, the Bible's full of death and, and, and horrible things and war and all this kind of stuff and everything like that. You know, can it be a more cheerful book in places? Because there's some places it's pretty dark. But you know what? Welcome to the human race. You study history about 10 minutes, you realize we live in a really dark world. We're broken. So I'm glad Joseph is broken. I'm, I'm glad he's down a couple pegs here because I need this anti-hero to understand how I can move forward and move out of my brokenness and have an encounter with a powerful God that my dreams can be brought to light. And then to see redemption. Okay, We can think Joseph's life's over here. 
He's been taken by a hostile family into exile and sold as a slave. 17 years old. It looks like his life is over. He's apart from his family. He's not that nice a kid anyways. His brothers, although it broke their heart, was probably saying, good riddance. You know? Can you, can you feel the pain and bitterness as they go to their father and say, we found this coat. It's covered with blood. Isn't this the coat of your son? They weren't saying, hey, this looks like our brother's coat. No, no, no. There's poison in what they're saying. They're accusing their father. They're saying, you, uh, you know, you put him up ahead of us. Well, he's not our brother. We don't want him. Oh, look, something bad happened to them. Isn't that a shame? I guess he's gone. Dad, maybe you'll learn a lesson here. Maybe you'll learn not to ostracize us, not to listen to somebody else's tattletale. Maybe, maybe you know, you'll learn from this horrible thing. We're teaching you a lesson, Dad. But here's the thing. God loved Joseph's brothers. He loved them and he was going to build a great nation out of these young men. And you know what? By the end of this account, we're going to see God redeem these broken, confused, messed up individuals and create something beautiful. You know, one thing I've learned as I've gotten a little older is that sometimes something bad happens to me. And sometimes I think, I'll never be the same again. My life is over. Or I'll never recover from that. And then years later, as God places, puts me back together, what happens? I encounter the same situation, but I'm on the other side of it now. And I look into the eyes of an individual and I recognize that I was there once. And I have a choice. I can either be as hard and cruel to them as someone was to me, or I can be as good as gracious as some people have been to me, and I can be that to them. Being a follower of Jesus Christ is about redemption. You think your life's over? You think something has hurt you so bad? You think this pandemic has put you down so bad that even God can't do anything about it? I beg to differ. Just as this young man named Joseph is going to someday become a great man, more important, he's going to be a man who is redeemed by the living God. This verse is probably quoted more times than some other passages of Scripture from the book of James, but it bears repeating. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. You may think you're going through something right now, and a lot of us are. Some of you have lost jobs. Some of you have lost loved ones. But you are not beyond God. He is doing a work right now. As I have seen over these last months and observed your lives, observed those who have been shut in, those who have lost jobs and that, I've been inspired by the people of God and them pulling together. And you know, one of the groups I've been most proud of are my fellow pastors. I've watched people that should be, you know, only snowed by this, rise up and become great leaders. God is not done. And you know what? This thing has not got us beat. Here we are, the church of Jesus Christ, meeting again, interacting, doing what we do. We're not beat. It may look like Joseph's down, but there's going to be a verse that's going to be repeated over and over in the next chapter. But God remembered Joseph. And God will remember each one of us. Your circumstances did not dictate that God is out of the picture. On the contrary, 
it might mean he has you right where he wants you right now. And that is all I got to say about that. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. We're going to lead in a couple songs. As promised, these services are not going to be super long to start. We're putting them online and you'll be able to watch this tomorrow if all the technology has worked out. Um, following the service, our greeters and our people are going to allow you to exit the building, starting at the back and then moving forward. Okay? Please maintain the, the two meter distance and please uh, don't congregate in the lobby and, and, uh, and uh, uh, start to meet as badly as you want to. And I badly want to talk to you all and things like that. But as we're doing this, we're just going to work on a system as more people come back and things like that, just in order to keep our people safe. Can you agree with that with me? Yeah, perfect. I really appreciate that. So why don't you stand? We're just going to do a couple more songs, and then we'll uh, dismiss you.
Cause you'd take what the enemy meant for evil And you'd turn it for good You'd turn it for good And you'd take what the enemy meant for evil And you'd turn it for good You'd turn it for good One more time, you'd turn You'd take what the enemy meant for evil And you'd turn it for good You'd turn it for good You'd take what the enemy meant for evil And you'd turn it for good You'd turn it for good And now I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord And I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord song could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever bring We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Oh, we live for you. And holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in one. And show me who you are And fill me with your heart And lead me in your love To those around me Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one Sing. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Oh, we live for you. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show.
beside you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me and I will build my life upon your love it is a Yeah.